What I want to do is, is open it up to discussion and, and your questions. And while you're, there are microphones uh, placed in the aisles, and also you can submit your questions through the poll everywhere uh, technique, if you'd like, prefer to do that. Uh, one thing I'm taking away from this is that in academics, we really should rethink promotion and tenure criteria <laughs> that are all about what I accomplished, not what we accomplished. And across clinical care, the, the RVU, <laughs> how much work did I do today, um, may be a, a corrosive influence. Please, we have the, and if you wouldn't mind saying who you are and your organizational relate, uh, affiliation. I, I'm not sure the mic is. Good morning. Oh, there we got. It's working now. So I'm Andrea Barandi Kids. I work for Leahy Hospital and Medical Center, but I'm here as a patient advocate. Um, so first of all, thank you for the story that says, "Oh, the only thing I can do well is talk to my patients." That's fabulous. From a patient perspective, that's exactly what we need from our physicians. Um, so my real question was. Um, from the standpoint of the use of social media for connectivity, when I lost my husband to lung cancer five years ago, being totally socially naive, I decided as an advocate I had to use social media. So I went on Twitter, Facebook. On Twitter, I found an incredibly engaged community of people who were focused on helping people with lung cancer. Patients, patient advocates, researchers, physicians, basically everything. We're very close and very close-knit. And I would say that um, everybody that I've actually met in person, we've had that real connection. So have we considered ways to build social networks using social media? I think social media is both a blessing and a curse. Um, and the example that you gave, where the, you were joining a community that already had a sense of purpose. Uh -huh. So you were using it to connect with each other, where right. you already had a fundamental uh -huh. basis for social interaction. It can be um, very positive. The flip side of that is that it can also just be a distraction, right, right? and result in social comparison. So I think it, the question really comes is, are you trying to use it to create and reinforce community that already exists? And then it can be incredibly positive versus are you just having more interaction at the expense of having face-to-face -face social interaction? Right, but someone had to create that community. So it was started by three or four people shortly before I joined. So we built it up together. So is there a way that physicians can join together and say, let's do a, a, a social media group. It can be a private group, whatever, around addressing loneliness, for example, or you know, joy in practice. Uh, let me just add one thing to that. I, I agree with what Dr. King said. I think that social media can be a, it can help sometimes, it can hurt sometimes. Uh, one way in which I've heard this described by the, the late Dr. John Cassiopo was that the ways in which social media helps is when it serves as a way station or a, a path to in-person connection. The places and times where it hurts is when we're using it passively uh, to, and so a quick example, it's Friday night, I'm feeling lonely, I don't have anyone to engage with, and I think that if I go on Twitter and Facebook and, I, and Instagram and just look at the, my feed and see what my friends are up to, that that will make me feel connected and less lonely. It tends, that tends actually not to happen. You actually end up feeling worse uh, about yourself. And so there is a, uh, it, 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 at the end, tech is a tool, social media is a tool. The question is how we use it. But there's also a slippery slope uh, with technology. Like you may start using uh, Twitter uh, for the purpose of connecting uh, with people who have had a shared experience. But if you're not careful, you may very quickly find yourself, you know, following all, a, a much broader network of people looking at their feeds all the time and trying to essentially supplement your social interaction with interactions with your Twitter feed. And that may also crowd out the time that you spend uh, in in-person interactions with people that you know and love. And that's a real danger, especially when you look at the um, st statistics on the amount of time people are spending on social media globally, and it is increasing uh, at a pretty significant pace. So that's, I think, where we have to be uh, careful. If, if you do end up using 
social media for clinicians to create connections between folks. I think about the Physician Moms Group, for example, on Facebook, which is a, a very large group of over 60,000 uh, physician moms. My wife is a part of it. Many of my friends are part of it. Uh, they find it extraordinarily like you know, helpful to go on there to be able to ask questions, et cetera. But my wife and many of the folks I've talked to have said that that is not a substitute for in-person connection. The best PMG interactions have been those that led to them connecting with people offline. I think our next person is on this side and then over to Dr. Sinsky. Hi. Oh, my name is Mary Gorman. I'm a wellness champion for the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Group and also a head and neck surgeon. I just wanted to hear your concrete um, ideas on effective listening. If you said you could go over them really quick. So. Sure. We could practice. Um, <laughs> So I think that there's a tendency, particularly if you've been trained in listening to patients, to sort of want to ask questions to solicit an opportunity to either give advice or share your own experience. So in the exercise, what you simply do is ask another person, what does it feel like to be you today? And not respond. So give them the full two minutes, but without sort of what are typical active listening techniques. So you're not nodding, you're not uh -huh you're not asking questions, and importantly, you're not also interjecting your own story. So you're just giving them that full two minutes to express themselves, like you're doing to me now. Um, so, and then switch. So it's a very simple exercise, but as you're listening, it's asking you also to reflect on what your own experience is. Do you feel like you want to ask me another question, give me advice that I'm not actually telling you how to listen well? Um, or um, share an experience, and by noticing your own behavioral tendencies of what you feel like you need to be doing in that situation, uh, that will allow you to start to modify your own behavior and become a more effective and compassionate listener moving forward. Your introduction of yourself actually, I think, illustrates another emerging organizational technique, and that's you're a, a wellness champion for the region of your healthcare system. We have some new newly appointed chief well, wellness officers here. The notion of having a C-suite level person in the health system. Not C-suite, but. Yeah. <laughs> I just promoted you. Not yet. <laughs> Doc, Dr. Sinsky. Yeah, thanks. So I'm Chris Sinsky. I'm a general internist, and I also work at the AMA. Um, and thank you so much, both of you, or all three of you, for your comments. As I was listening to you talk about the importance of loneliness and how we have more social isolation now, I was listening to it in the context of healthcare, of course. And I've been thinking a lot lately about how our mental model of healthcare has shifted over time from a relationship based model to a transactional model, and how so many of our infrastructures were well intended in isolated silos to result in better quality, but they've actually created more and more isolation, more fragmentation. And it's almost as if we no longer have receptor sites for the value of relationship. So I'm thinking about how our EHRs are designed, about how performance measurement is, about how our E&M bullet points are designed, the fragmentation of care, uh, across inpatient and outpatient domains now not having continuity. So I'm wondering if you can think with me about the importance of sort of re-emerging um, the relational nature of care to balance this very transactional nature that we've gone into. So I'll, I'll leave it to you to respond, both of you. Well, thank you for that question, Christine, and, and more importantly, thank you for all the work that you've done on this issue uh, at the AMA. I think you, you hit the nail on the head. We have, um, in our eagerness to embrace new tools to advance health, new therapeutics, new diagnostics, new technology, uh, we have taken our eye off the ball on, of relationships and have, I think, lost a sense of just how powerful those relationships are in the healing process. And to shift that, I think, is as much a structural problem as it is a cultural problem. Uh, and so when you think about what are the stories that we tell in our journals, in morning report, in noon conferences, at CME conferences, like what are the stories that we tell about medicine? Uh, are they always technical stories or are they human stories? I think you would find that the balance is really shifted to technical stories. And the way that we, I think, recapture the importance of the 
of human relationships is we start, I think, in part by choosing what stories we tell uh, in medicine, because that's a, a signal of what we value. Uh, and then I think that the other elements that, uh, that we were talking about earlier, thinking about like, what do we reward then within medicine? Do we, what do we do for people who are adept at building great relationships with patients? Do we hold them up and celebrate them? Do we promote them? Do we reward them financially? Do we uh, protect their time to do more of that uh, as opposed to hoisting more administrative responsibilities on them? on them? What do we do to reward people who do this well? I think that's sort of the second uh, step of this. Uh, but I think more broadly that this is not just a challenge in medicine. I think as a society we have taken our eye off of relationships as being an important part uh, of healing. And not just the, an important part, I would say the foundational part uh, of how we operate and, and, and how we feel and how we function as a society. And so I think re, refocusing on relationships is not easy, but the good news is that it is, I think, instinctual for people at, at a really deep level. You may have to peel back the layers of, uh, uh, you know, of training and the layers of experience that have told them that that stuff is, they may feel it's important inside, but they should really publicly focus on other stuff. But the truth is, instinctively, I think people recognize that relationships matter, and when they don't have them, they matter as well. One last thing I'll say is about the patient relationship. So when it comes to our, uh, you know, it's one thing to talk about the relationship the clinicians have with each other. But then there's also this question of what are our relationships like with our patients. And I don't have a 100% clear answer on what kind of relationships we should be trying to build. But I think that this is something we should really discuss because I think that what we should be thinking about in light of Dr. King's comments are not just about the kind of relationship where a patient can come to you and necessarily feel that they're hurt. That's very important. But is there more that we could be doing to share from our side as clinicians? Now, that, that raises a whole set of thorny issues um, about, well, we were trained to be objective. We're trained to not necessarily share our baggage. We're supposed to help someone else, not you know, bring our issues to them. And I'm not saying that we should hoist our problems upon patients. But there is a degree of self-disclosure which helps strengthen relationships and can help build, uh, I think, ultimately a therapeutic uh, effect you know, for the care that we provide. Uh, but how do we do that? I don't think we really train students in what kind of self-disclosure is appropriate, when it's appropriate, how to do it in a way that feels good for a patient and for you. But to me, this is actually where I think uh, some of our discussion needs to be and some of our training needs to be. It can also be extremely validating for students because if you're a first-year medical student, a first-year nursing student, you're coming in uh, to school thinking, okay, I've got to learn all this stuff that I'm not expert at, uh, you're really feeling pretty poorly about yourself. You're feeling like you're starting from below ground zero and hopefully you'll be able to build up and, and not do harm. But instead, if you, are, if you hear in a validating way that in fact the greatest tools that you need uh, are the ones that you innately have and we're gonna help you cultivate those even more, uh, in addition, of course, to giving you the knowledge that you need. That's a very different <laughs> message that we send to first-year medical students. I, like all of you, have been deeply concerned about the depression and suicide rate among clinicians broadly, but particularly among our trainees, among students and, and residents. And I think that, in part, we are hoisting extraordinary demands on them, that not just demands in terms of time. We are incredibly resilient in terms of how much time we can make to do the things that need to be done. But this is a massive gap in self-efficacy that we have created, where we have led people to believe that uh, often that they don't have what it takes to do what's needed, that they need to transform who they are instead of becoming more of who they naturally are. So I do think relationships need to take a, a more front and center uh, you know, you know, a sort of role in our training, uh, in the culture within our institutions, and also in terms of what we reward. I think next up in the queue, we have somebody on the poll everywhere with a question. Yes. Uh, the question is, how do we look to support each other through loneliness across clinician roles when hierarchies may exist? How do we create opportunities for those conversations? Dr. King, this notion of social hierarchies is, I'm sure you, you see, is very strong uh, within healthcare, uh, and then especially within academic settings <laughs> with ranks and the, the like. Do you have any insights on, on transcending that to create a greater sense of cohesion? I mean, I think that there's, um, oftentimes it feels like that there can be a tension between how do we achieve social cohesion and collaboration if we are existing in a hierarchy. And I think it first begins with just recognizing that we're all humans and we all have 
the same purpose. So um, my guess is that most people in this room came to medical medicine to some degree with a sense of calling or purpose with a desire to be of service. And if you start with that base that we're all here for the same reason and trying to achieve the same goals, then you start to recognize each other from a different level. And what is you'll frequently see within teams is the most powerful way of bringing people together as a collectivity that always transcends hierarchy is a sense of common vision and a sense of common purpose. Um, because there's a sense of collective cohesion then that starts to emerge. And I think that for me, one of the biggest concerns actually about burnout is what does it, it does to a sense of calling um, among physicians. Um, the re study that was done um, at the Mayo Clinic that essentially was showing that when someone's burned out, the likelihood that they'll report medicine being um, a sense of a calling drops, but the odds of it dropped significantly. So having that self-reinforcing identity of a higher sense of purpose and a higher sense of calling and a devotion to service is a key way to overcome the competitive nature, which is often endemic. And then lastly, just acknowledging to the extent that there is competition, for instance, among medical residents where people have spent their sort of entire young adult lives trying to achieve, 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 and that's often been an individual level endeavor, not acknowledging that there is this a latent sense of competition can be really corrosive as well. So being honest about sort of where people stand, but also recognizing a higher purpose they're calling can really help Unfortunately, we're coming down uh, on our time limits, so if we could try to be very brief, and I think we only have time for one or two more questions at the most. Hi, I am Sheila Bosch. I am an overwhelmed assistant professor uh, in interior design, oddly enough, at the University of Florida. And you mentioned the loss of the uh, doctor's lounge. And we know, for example, emergency physicians and nurses won't go sit in a break room, for example. And, and, and physicians are losing offices, right, to make more space for clinical areas. So I'm just curious as to whether any of you have thought about the role of design, like connection to nature, uh, visual and acoustic privacy somewhere in the care team station, that sort of thing. There's an interesting convergence going on. Actually, uh, just last week I visited Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson University, and they have a design lab within the health sciences community, the new school at the University of Texas, Austin, has brought uh, a design lab into the health sciences campus. I think there's a lot of uh, growing momentum around using the built environment uh, as a tool to, to build group cohesion. But it's, uh, it's a great interface and one way I don't think we would have thought of that much 10 years ago or 15 years ago. I've done some research on using wearable sensors, again, to understand how office floor layout affects physician interaction. So, for instance, you have a racetrack layout or sort of a corridor layout. And space obviously really matters. It structures the way that we have social interaction. And one of the biggest sort of cautions in this area in particular, there's a tendency to sort of think that, again, more interaction is better. And that's oftentimes exactly what needs to not happen. So ensuring that there are, there are private spaces where there's quiet room for reflection and having modifiable floor plans so that if you are recognizing, for instance, there's actually too much interaction, we need to be able to shift it. Making sure that there's mobility and flexibility in the design can be really important. And then lastly, also allowing the patients into areas that are typically sealed off as being physician areas can reinforce this sense of purpose and calling. So it's very simple things like having pictures of patients or patient stories and bringing that in um, can be really beneficial from a design standpoint. Thank you. I think, uh, Dr. Malone, you may have the last word. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that puts a lot of pressure on me. I might start feeling lonely. Um, <laughs> I'm Bev Malone, I'm the CEO for the National League for Nursing, and this is a wonderful discussion, more time required, but what I'm thinking of is that all roads lead to quality patient care, and so all of the relationships go through the patient in my, I, that, so that means we can connect with our other colleagues and other disciplines and interior design or whatever the discipline is, because if we connected the relationships through our patients. But I was also thinking about the individual and moving forward. 
and I was wondering where does mentoring fit into having uh, connectivity and someone seeing more in you than you can see in yourself at the time? Dr. Murthy? Well, this is such a beautiful question. And I, I think you're right that so much of the benefit of this work is that it can ultimately help to improve the care that we provide to patients. But as much as we focus on the importance of patient care, and as central as that can and should be to our mission, I think it's also okay to say that our own well-being as clinicians is also important because we are members of society. We are people who deserve to be fulfilled just like anyone else in society. That's okay to have as a goal in and of itself. And I think that to that extent, that means that we have to invest in each other. I think that's where mentorship comes in. We have to be there for each other. That's where support from colleagues come in. Uh, and we have to have an environment that ultimately enables us and empowers us to bring our own gifts to the work that we do. And I believe that we all have our gifts. Uh, we may not always know what they are. That's part of life's journey. Uh, but it is what we are at our best when we are focusing on our gifts, whether that's our generosity, whether that's our compassion, whether that's our discerning intellect, whatever that might be. You know, I think more broadly, as I think about the conversations that are going to take place here today you know, and, over, and over tomorrow, uh, when I think about this, how we're going to address this larger issue of uh, well-being and how we're going to rebuild connection in the profession, I think this is about far more than, about, than our profession. Actually, I think this is more, this is bigger. This is actually about the country and about the world and what's happening right now. You know, you look at any corner uh, of, of, of our country uh, and you find... Uh, groups that are experiencing loneliness at high, high rates. And you look at other countries uh, across the world, whether it's Great Britain, which recently appointed a minister, cabinet-level minister to address loneliness, or whether it's you know, other countries in the Middle East or in South Asia or in China or Latin America that are struggling with loneliness. And what is the common denominator here is that people are starting to recognize that the connections between uh, each other are fraying and that this is having consequences for our health and for how we function and how people operate in their work and in schools, and we have to do something about it. And I raise this because the work that we do in our profession to rebuild connections can be an inspiration, I believe, to folks well outside the profession who are also thinking about how to do this in an environment that's resource constrained when everyone doesn't have enough time. How do you actually build stronger connections? How do you create a culture that supports people uh, for who they are, not just because of what they can do. And so I, I would love for us as a profession to think about our work on clinician well-being in this context, that we are addressing a problem that is being felt much more broadly than within our profession, that the work we do uh, can reverberate across the country and around the world and help other sectors figure out how to address loneliness. And also in a day and an age when people are very cynical where their trust in public institutions and private institutions has fallen considerably, the trust that people still maintain in nurses and in doctors is still relatively high. And the question that comes to, that comes to my mind whenever I reflect on that is, what are we going to do with that trust? How are we going to use it to advance the overall well-being of society? And this is an area where our focusing on this issue can lift this issue up and help people see that this is important, that this is an issue that has to be addressed, that there's urgency behind it. The solutions that we broker, whether they are technical structural solutions or cultural solutions, are ones that can have a ripple effect and can help inform other sectors that are struggling with this. Because the most common question that I get uh, when I travel and talk to communities about loneliness, the um, most common question after people disclose that they're experiencing this is, what should I do? How can we make this better? What can I do in my organization? And those are the questions that we are and can help figure out uh, as a profession. So I want us to step up and to be leaders in that respect. Again, not just for our profession, but for the country and for the world. Um, and if we rebuild those connections between each other, we are going to be rebuilding the foundation uh, on which we operate. To do it, though, uh, last thought I'll leave you with is we can't do it solely with our head. We can't do this solely as an intellectual exercise. We have, this has to be an exercise of the heart as well. We have to recognize that as much as our head matters, 
that medicine is also fundamentally uh, an art that's guided by your heart. Every Friday morning when I was attending at Brigham and Women's Hospital, I would gather my residents and medical students, our team together, and we would step outside the hospital, literally 10 feet outside the hospital, sit in an open area, and we would read poems together. Poems that would actually, and then we would discuss them. And there was, there were always poems that pushed us to reflect on our own life and our calling and whether there was a gap between the values that we aspire to and the values that we were living and how we could close that gap. And what we found is we all had gaps. Whether you were an attending or a medical student or a resident or a nursing student, everyone had gaps. And we came together to try to figure out how to close that. That was not work of the head. That was work of the heart. And if we lose sight of the fact that that work of the heart is a core part of who we are as a profession, then we will lose our soul in medicine. We will become technicians as opposed to clinicians. And at the heart of, of that work, the work of the heart is, is love. You know, we don't talk about love enough as a profession. We don't talk about the role that it plays in our care of patients and the care, the care that we have to provide for each other. But I have long believed that love is the oldest medicine that we have. We may forget about it at times uh, in the light of new technology and new therapeutics, but it is that ingredient uh, that makes healing possible. It's what enables us as colleagues to be there and to help each other heal during difficult times after an adverse event happens, uh, after a patient dies, or after we're feeling uh, burnt out, like in the hospital. So let us keep that in mind as we move forward, recognizing that we are, we are clinicians who bring both our head and our heart to the work that we do. That's when we're at our best. And as an institution, as a culture, if we can support both our head and our heart, if love can be that foundation uh, on which we build stronger relationships and a stronger profession, then I think ultimately we, we will emerge not only providing better care for patients, not only being more resilient as clinicians, but being a beacon of light and hope for a world that is struggling with loneliness and that needs stronger connections. I really apologize that the uh, tyranny of the clock forces us to end the session, but we're going to take Dr. King's advice and during the rest of the day focus on the quality of our interactions as opposed to the quantity uh, of our interactions and continue this discussion. Please join me in thanking Dr. King.